Uh, thanks for joining us today. I hope you're still dealing well with the coronavirus. It's so nice that we're allowed to now take off our masks, although I hope everybody's still being very careful since there's plenty of people still not vaccinated around us. Um, uh, we uh, are not yet authorized to go back to the auditorium um, to meet in person, but we hope that will uh, that will uh, return sometime before the end of the year. Um, until then, uh, myself, Aaron Lamb, as well as uh, uh, John Tassie, who was uh, doing all the video streaming before me, uh, will continue to uh, set up these video streams on the third Saturday of uh, each month. Your hosts today are uh, Lyle LaRoche and Jean Van Vliet, our main uh, directors. Uh, Lyle's also the president. Uh, Bill Manning is here. He's our uh, a director and the, the videographer. Uh, John Tassie is, is still a director and our webmaster. Uh, Steve Pendergast does a great job with our newsletter. Uh, Bill Lewis uh, writes up our meeting summaries. And myself, Aaron Lamb, I'm the facilitator and, and uh, handle the video streaming now. Um, together, we have over 900 members. Um, everyone is a volunteer, and you can be too. Our support to you is in the way of our website. I uh, do expect that everybody online has checked it out so far. There's uh, some wonderful uh, resources on there, especially our uh, uh, history of newsletters. Um, they have wonderful write-ups of, of each of the speakers' presentations. Um, there's also uh, uh, the link to the monthly video streaming uh, that we have on the third Saturday of each month. And perhaps most importantly, we have a hotline number. As you see there, that phone number is also available on the website. And that's for anybody, uh, especially new people uh, that are just uh, discovering our group to give us a call and uh, get some support uh, to help answer some of the questions that you might have uh, throughout your, uh, your treatment. Um, that line will take you to uh, uh, Jean Van Vliet or one of our other directors who can uh, assist you with uh, getting the information that you need. As I said, we are a volunteer organization and we do need your help. Uh, we are looking for people to help recruit and schedule new speakers. Uh, to share your experience, uh, any recent um, uh, treatment that you might have had, especially uh, new treatments that are not uh, perhaps uh, mainstream yet. Uh, we also need help with people taking hotline calls. So please do contact us uh, through the website or that phone number uh, if you're willing to, to help out. Now, our support group purpose is to share patient-focused experience on becoming your own case manager through informing, networking, and caring. We're a group of experienced participants, but we are not medical professionals. Any sharing that anyone does may not be substitute for your medical counsel, but we do wanna help you to understand the questions that you need to ask your own medical professionals uh, throughout the course of your treatment. We do need your support. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, and therefore your donations are tax deductible. We don't have any medical or religious affiliations. Uh, and even though we're not meeting in person, uh, our costs are very much the same. Uh, we do advertising in the Union Tribune to try to uh, uh, get to new members to um, uh, aware of our organization. Uh, we also have expenses for uh, putting up the, uh, the Zoom meetings uh, every month, as well as our website. So please do go online and make a, a donation. Uh, the online uh, donations are made via PayPal, or you can send a check to us in the mail. And uh, that address there uh, is also available on the website. You can get that. Unfortunately, we haven't yet uh, determined our speaker for next month. Uh, so please do keep your eye on the website and the mailings and uh, we'll announce um, uh, who will be speaking next month as soon as we know. Um, however, for today, we are happy to welcome back yet once again, uh, Bernadette Greenwood. Um, and she is uh, the Chief Research Officer at Halidex. Uh, she now has her master's uh, a variety of certifications, especially in uh, imaging for um, uh, x-ray as well as MRI. Uh, I, I apologize, I can't remember all of the, uh, the different certifications there, but um, Bernadette is certainly well-versed in all things imaging. And so with that, 
Burnett, please uh, go ahead and share your screen and take it away. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I explained to Aaron a little earlier, um, I don't have much of a voice because I sang karaoke last night. So we'll, uh, we'll make the best of it. Here we go. All right. Perfect. Um, so can you still hear me? Yes, can hear you and we can see the presentation perfectly. Great, all right. So um, I think it's important that I do disclose that I have a patent pending for the surgical technique that I invented and developed at Desert Medical Imaging, now Halo DX. And I am an employee of Halo DX. So we're gonna go over a lot of stuff today. We'll talk about the history of biopsy strategies, the evolution of multiparametric MRI of the prostate, technical aspects of MRI guided biopsies, the rationale for MRI guided laser focal therapy for prostate cancer, I'll give you an update on NCT 02243033, which is our phase two clinical trial utilizing laser interstitial thermal therapy for prostate cancer. Time permitting, I will delve into tissue-based genomics and talk about flaciclovine F18, also known commercially as Axamin. So when we look at prostate MRI. Um, my earliest research was in breast MRI and it complemented mammography and ultrasound. Same with prostate MRI. It's a complement for the standard of care, which was PSA digital rectal exam and transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy. That's what TRUS stands for, transrectal ultrasound. And so that was sort of a systematic random biopsy sort of taking you know, six cores from the left, six cores from the right, and kind of seeing what you get. I nicknamed it Poke and Hope, which a lot of um, folks in urology don't like, um, but truly it's a, it's a random systematic biopsy. What we do is MR inbore targeted biopsy. Now we've got uh, opportunity to take the MR and fuse it with ultrasound. So then my question became, you know, if I could see it and I could stick it, why not also treat it? If it looks like a skunk and it smells like a skunk, it's probably a skunk. So we're able to take pictures of the needle in the thrown position. So it's indisputable in a court of law where the tissue came from. So let's take a walk through time and look at the literature from the 1920s to today, where um, you know way back when the biopsies were performed using an incision in the perineum, and then uh, the doctor would palpate, feel around, take samples uh, through that incision, kind of <laughs> barbaric. Then in the 30s, Astraldi got smart and said, well, why don't we put a stainless steel sound down the urethra, use a finger to palpate the gland and guide a needle to the posterior aspect or the back of the gland. Then in the 60s, Watanabe-san and his team provided the first clinically useful transrectal ultrasound images of the prostate gland. And at the same time, McNeil et al. proposed the language that describes the three distinct glandular zones of the prostate. Bernadette. In the 80s, we saw evolution of ultrasound transducers. So we were able to do transcavity imaging so not only could we uh, insert these probes uh, transrectally, we could insert them transvaginally and do things like um, ovarian follicle counts and things like that for fertility. But in men, we're able to insert the transducer per rectum and take a close look at the prostate gland. And then in 1986, uh, my friend Dick Ablin from University of Arizona he developed the PSA test and it was released in 1986 for prostate cancer screening. And then in 89, Hodge et al. developed the sextant biopsy schema where they would take three cores from the right, three cores from the left, and that was called the sextant biopsy. Well, then Stamianescu said, well, if six is good, you know, 18 or 24 is better. And so rather than just taking the 
cores from the areas of these red dots, they would take cores from the red, the blue, the green, or some combination thereof. But the problem is, what if the tumor is here? What if it's here? What if it's in between? You're still going to miss it. So Winston Barzell came up with a saturation biopsy technique where he used a transperineal plate and took samples every three millimeters throughout the entire prostate. But the same problem exists. What if it's here? What if it's here? And we don't take into account the Z depth, uh, the throw. This only takes into account, you know, front to back and left to right. So it doesn't take depth into account. So to do a saturation biopsy, and I have to acknowledge my friend, Dr. Tom Palasik for these slides from Duke University. So you could sort of see all the stuff that's needed to do a saturation biopsy. And here you see an image on ultrasound. The reflection in this monitor shows the hands of the doctor and there's the wand, the transducer inserted in the patient. And this is the prostate gland here. This is the inferior wall of the urinary bladder. The black stuff here is urine. And you see the needle going into the prostate. But the question is, what's it going after? You can't see tumors in here. All you really see is the margin of the gland and you're able to aim and kind of poke and hope. So once you do the sort of A, B, C, one, two, three, I sunk your battleship, you end up with this. And these are pathology cups with the specimens in them. And each of these is two to $300 to put under the microscope. So when people argue with me about the cost of MRI and oh my God, it's so expensive, yada, yada, I say, you know, random biopsy and pathology is more expensive. This is why the American Urological Association in October 2019 updated their policy statement to say MRI before biopsy in cases of high PSA. So we don't want to be stabbing in the dark. We don't want to be doing blind biopsy. We want an image showing us what to aim at. So this is sort of silly. Good news, the exploratory surgery turned up negative. So this is a lot like saturation biopsy. I've got a lot of patients that present to our clinic that have had multiple biopsies that are negative. And the reason why isn't because they don't have cancer, it's because the needle didn't fall in the right spot. And so um, it's very important that we hit the target. So way back in 2004, a team in Germany did the first MRI targeted biopsies in Bohr um, for Philips, uh, a subsidiary of Philips called Invivo, who developed the in Bohr biopsy technique. So you could see here, this is the ultrasound image, and here is the MRI image. So if this is my husband or my brother or my dad, um, I want this image guiding the biopsy, not this image. So back, back way in the day, 2009, the NCCN guidelines, National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines, pretty much said, you know, repeat, say repeat DRE, repeat biopsy, repeat, repeat. Then in 2012, for the first time, multi-parametric MRI was mentioned in the guideline. Also in 2012, the European Society for Urogenital Radiology published their guidelines regarding prostate MRI. And then the American College of Radiology followed suit quickly after that and developed the PIRADS guidelines where they um, established a lexicon for description of imaging features and uh, prostate characteristics so that everybody's using the same language and um, reading the images the same way. So it's pretty much an if this and that then this kind of an algorithm. If it's dark on the T2 weighted sequence, 
if it's black on the high B value image, if it's bright, excuse me, if it's dark on the apparent diffusion coefficient image, and if it's bright on the high B value image, plus it perfuses like crazy, you should probably stick a needle in it. And we've got all kinds of great fancy software that we could use to create these color overlays, segmentations, pharmacokinetic maps, and we're able to call out the thing that looks most suspicious and aim the needle there. So this is an interesting paper out of Greece talking about PSA density being better than PSA and Gleason score to prognosticate. So PSA density is simply uh, the PSA divided by the gland volume. So um, this is a, a, an important number as you guys are going through your journey, try not to focus so much on PSA in a vacuum as PSA density. Then in 2016, NCCN uh, uh, updated the guidelines to say multi-parametric MRI followed by lesion targeting may maximize the detection of higher risk disease and limit the detection of lower risk disease. Like I'm not a rocket scientist or anything, but that makes perfect sense to me. And then October 25th, 2019, the AUA policy statement um, agreed with that philosophy. And these are the individuals that sat on that committee. So you've got some very uh, expert individuals lending their opinions. So one funny thing though about the NCCN guidelines is that a lot of the recommendations are a little bit buried. So I see the PSA greater than three or suspicious DRE go to further evaluation and indications. Then we go there. Finally, we get to biomarkers that improve specificity of screening, talk about MR targeting, all the uh, references that relate to that. So you have to dig a little bit to find the biomarkers um, and a reference to MRI targeting. So it's a little bit uh, deep in there, but the bottom line is uh, MRI and certain types of biopsy techniques and biomarkers maximize detection of high risk disease and limit the detection of low risk disease, which is what we wanna do. So back in 2006, uh, my team that I'm studying under for my PhD now, uh, they published some uh, important research regarding the accuracy of prostate MRI and came up with an area under the receiver operating curve of 91%. The team at Yale about a decade later uh, repeated that experiment and came up with a negative predictive value for prostate MRI of 96%. So in the hands of experienced individuals, we can use MRI uh, very successfully to, to screen and diagnose. So I'm gonna talk about apparent diffusion coefficient value and what that means. Um, I know you guys aren't all physicists or hold degrees in uh, uh, imaging, but I'll try to put it in layman's terms. But before I do that, I'm gonna argue the three T versus one and a half T argument. A lot of people uh, holler that, oh my God, you have to have a three T MRI. No, you don't, you really don't. Here's why. When you look at the number of MRI scanners in North America, the vast majority of them are 1.5 Tesla and that's field strength. 10% are three Tesla. So if I'm out there telling men that everybody's got to get a 3T MRI, what that's doing is it's limiting accessibility. So the, the thing that's way more important than field strength is who's at the helm? Who is the individual pushing the buttons and taking the pictures? It's got to be a credential technologist. What kind of software do they have? Is it modern, state-of-the-art, able to perform high B-value diffusion sequences? What kind of MRI coil are they using? Is it a high channel count coil? Um, what was the preparation of the patient? Have they gone hungry for 12 hours, not had any water or food? And did they get some sort of a um, uh, injection to decrease bowel motion and um, things that are gonna make the image blurry? And then lastly, and most importantly, I could have the best images in the world, but if the experience of the radiologist is uh, inferior, 
you're going to get a lousy report. So um, don't let anybody try to convince you that you have to have a 3T MRI. It's not true. And here's an example. This patient was imaged at an ivory tower academic institution. This is the 3T image on the right. And here's our one and a half T image on the left. Obviously much better. Here's another example. Same patient within one week. Here's our one and a half T image. And here's the 3T image. And you see these kind of blurry lines going through the anatomy and, and sort of obscuring things. That's motion artifact. So anything that's bad at 1.5 Tesla is linearly worse at three Tesla. So um, if anybody tries to convince you uh, that 3T is the be all end all, uh, it's not true. So going back to apparent diffusion coefficients. When we look at these uh, histology slides and compare them to the MRI image, here I've got an apparent diffusion coefficient value of 1,240. And this ends up being a Gleason score three plus three. Now here's a ADC of 990 and notice it's much darker. This is a three plus four. And then here, even blacker, lower ADC of 660, Gleason four plus five. So it's not like a hard fast rule but the general thinking is the lower the ADC, the more aggressive the disease. So then when I look at the prostate and I see this area, this area, this area, and it's perfusing like crazy, where do I want to put the needle? The ADC value, when I put the cursor over this spot, is 691. If I move it just a couple of pixels here, the ADC is over 1,000. I don't want a specimen from here. I want it from here. And this is the gold that I'm looking for because let's face it, the problem with transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy is the throw of the needle is only about 1.8 centimeters. So as deep as you go, it kind of doesn't matter because the cancer could be far toward the front. And no matter how many times you do the biopsy, Every year, it's going to be negative. Meanwhile, this thing's growing. So the big issue is it could miss it. It could pick up something inconsequential while there's harboring uh, aggressive disease elsewhere. Or what we could do is skim the edge of it and miss the aggressive part. So um, this is why we've said goodbye to the days of trust biopsy. And Tom Hambrock from Nijmegen, uh, earned the Lauterborough Award back in 2010 for his important work comparing 10-core random biopsy to MR-guided biopsy in Gleason score greater than equal to seven cancer. And you could see how well the MR-targeted biopsy performs compared to the random biopsy. And here's some literature um, I contributed to these three different articles talking about in biopsy from many, many years ago. Um, so it, it doesn't really need to be justified any longer. So now um, the rationale for prostate MRI is we're able to do the targeted biopsy of tumor suspicious regions, and we could do planning to target it. And we use the MRI system, a little um, piece of hardware here that's mounted to a little a needle guide that goes in the patient's rectum. And then we have software that can show us the anatomy and let us aim at the most suspicious looking spot. So it's just a very simple software package that shows us the trajectory of the needle and allows us to aim at the most suspicious looking area. And this is what it looks like in a clinical setting. And then once we get the tissue out, it's in, in the end of the needle and it goes into a cup of formalin. And then that gets sent off to the laboratory where these little wormy looking uh, specimens get sliced. They get cut, they get stained, and they get placed under the microscope. And that's when the pathologist describes what they see. So um, the way our reports are structured, 
I ask that our pathologist put in bold red writing what the worst looking thing is, and then break down by core length, cancer length, percent involvement, and Gleason score exactly what's going on. We get a photomicrograph of the cellular architecture, and they put a JPEG image of the MR guided biopsy with the needle in the thrown position. So again, in a court of law, it would be indisputable where this tissue came from. So what is Gleason score? So Gleason gray determines Gleason score, and I liken it to Skittle sorting. Gleason score is a scale of one to five, with the one being the most organized benign looking cells, and five being the most disorganized uh, scary looking cells, and three being somewhere in the middle, and two on this side and four on that side. So let's say we put the specimen under the microscope and the dominant cell pattern is three. That's the primary Gleason grade. And let's say the second most uh, proliferative cell pattern is Gleason four. That's the secondary Gleason grade. So primary plus secondary equals the score. So that's three plus four. Now let's say another patient specimen comes in, the most prevalent cell type is four and the secondary is three. That man is still a Gleason seven, but he has a worse prognosis because he's got a dominant four pattern. So he's a four plus three rather than a three plus four. If that doesn't make sense, you can email me or call me later and I could go over it again. So all my patients, when we do consultations, my urologist partner, myself, uh, when we do consults with the patients, we always refer them to the NCCN guidelines so that they can look at active surveillance, surgery, radiation, cryo, HIFU hormones, immunotherapy, chemotherapy, radiopharmaceuticals, clinical trials, and other treatments. We want our patients to be fully informed before they make a decision about what they want to do. And once they do decide, if they do decide that they want to have laser focal therapy, um, they could be enrolled in our trial. I've ceased accrual for the study. Um, we've begun doing it now commercially. Um, all the men, the 201 men that are in the study, will be followed for 20 years. So although I'm not recruiting anymore for new patients, our cohort of 201 men will be observed for the next two decades. And some are already 11 years into their follow-up. So how do we do it? We use the exact same system that we use for the biopsy, put this little needle guide in the rectum, but rather than delivering a biopsy gun, we use a laser fiber, we pop that into the prostate, and we observe using real-time MRI thermometry um, what we're ablating as we ablate it. So now you'll notice on this image, this is the visualization platform that we use. This is the laser box itself. And there's the computer system that we use to generate these images. These aren't prostate images. These are images of the brain of a child. So this was initially used in children for intractable epilepsy. And I thought, well, if it's safe enough to stick in the brain of a child, I could pop it through the rectal wall and put it in the prostate. So I did the early preclinical testing with these FDA cleared devices at MD Anderson on dogs and pigs with my colleagues, Dr. Roger McNichols and Dr. Jason Stafford. And then I, I wanted to get it installed at an ivory tower academic hospital, but the process was very arduous. So I called uh, the team at Desert Medical Imaging, now Halo Diagnostics, and said, can I bring this thing here? So we did the first human being on May 24th, 2010. So we're approaching our 11 year anniversary. So here's some pictures of the different devices that we use. Um, this is a non-cooled laser fiber and you could see it inserted in a turkey breast. And I've got the sheath pulled back so that we've got the fiber exposed. Uh, here's the visualization platform. I'm able to witness using thermal maps what tissue is irreversibly damaged. And I have a little graph showing me the temperature over the course of time. And what we end up with is a very nice area of ablation with a crisp boundary between untreated and treated tissue. This is the difference between laser and other energy sources. 
So back in the day when I was first investigating this, I tried to prove it didn't work. And in my efforts to prove it didn't work, I proved that it did work. And it was far superior to cryotherapy and HIFU and electroporation and RF because of this boundary between dead and viable tissue. So here's uh, the team of people that did that experiment. Um, and so you know what it looks like. MRI is really, really useful for creating pictures, but it also can help us um, with tissue contrast, quantification of flow, blood flow, or cerebrospinal fluid, anything that, that moves, we can measure perfusion, diffusion, phase shifts. Um, and the things that we use to, to measure these things are in the scan menu and the, and the technologist is the one plugging in these parameters. So if that's no good, you know, garbage in, garbage out. So a lot of people don't understand that you could take this very same scan data that we use to create the pictures and use a fancy calculus called Arrhenius modeling and generate the thermal map from that data. That's what lets us look at what we're doing as we do it and create this irreversible damage estimate and look at what we're killing as we kill it. So not only can we contour to what we want to destroy, we could put little safety boundaries over things like the neurovascular bundles responsible for erection, the external urethral sphincter responsible for urinary continence and the rectal wall, which we don't want to damage because uh, that could become a surgical emergency. So these little safety cursors that we put up uh, make it so that the system will shut off if the temperature exceeds a preset threshold. Now, who are we doing this in? We're doing it in treatment naive patients. We're doing it in salvage candidates who come to us after radiation or brachy or proton or even after prostatectomy. So I tweeted this out a couple of years ago, a few years ago. Um, this patient had tumor recurrence at the surgical anastomosis where after his prostatectomy, they reconnected his bladder. So the tumor came back, we were able to go in there and destroy it. Here again, you see the thermal map. We do an initial test dose of around 100 degrees Fahrenheit just to see where the fiber is to make sure it's in the proper place. Then we increase the um, energy to something around 12 watts. Here's the irreversible damage estimate. So I presented this back in 2011, the early experience with it. And um, again, we've been at it now for over a decade. Here's a quick case to show you. This is an axial image of the prostate gland slicing the man kind of like a loaf of bread transversely through the pelvis. So here's his left hip, here's his right hip. This is the rectal wall in the back. Here's the prostate. And you see this tumor, Gleason three plus four. Here it is on the high B value image. Here it is on the ADC map. We went in there and we ablated it and we got rid of it. So now you see it, now you don't. Here's the area of coagulation necrosis that we created. There's the thermal map. Here's the irreversible damage estimate. And the reason why we go big with this is we wanna create a margin around it. So not only is the MRI visible tumor gone, but there's a big margin around it also gone. Here's a side view. So we're looking at the urinary bladder up here. The rectum is here with the needle guide inside it. Here's the prostate. And you can see in the head foot direction, we got a nice uh, area of coagulation necrosis. And then a six month biopsy, and we biopsy all our research patients at six months to make sure nothing microscopic is brewing that might declare itself later. So here's the needle in the thrown position in the area where we did the treatment and he had a negative biopsy. And now here's some surgical specimens illustrating what I discussed earlier. Remember I, I showed you the image of the tissue necrotization and the crisp margin <coughs> between treated and untreated tissue. It's about one millimeter with laser. But now look at it with cryo and HIFU and even RF. 
It's very thick, very fluffy, kind of an indistinct border between dead and viable tissue. So that's why, in my opinion, laser is king. So last year, when we ran our numbers after 181 patients, we're now up to 201. And our numbers have stayed about the same. For around the last four years, um, we've seen very stable results. Uh, most of our patients are in the 60 to 70 age range. The treatment naive patients, most of the tumors that we treat are in the peripheral zone. In the salvage men, the ones who've had radiation or surgery, we do everything. We do peripheral zone, transition zone, central zone, seminal vesicles, bladder wall, everything. You name it, we'll treat it. Um, all comers for salvage. The Gleason score breakdown, the vast majority of our patients are Gleason 7 um, in the treatment naive group. Again, all comers for salvage. And one thing I really don't like reading or hearing is some people say, oh, you know, Greenwood only treats three plus threes, desert medical imaging only does three plus threes. That's not true. Um, that's a, a, a false statement. Uh, what we do is large volume three plus threes that are MRI visible. Most three plus threes that are not MRI visible, in other words, they're MRI occult, those can usually be watched with active surveillance. But if something's big enough that we could see it at MR, we get it. So 27% three plus threes, 57% three plus fours, and 16% four plus threes in the treatment naive cohort. In the salvage cohort, the vast majority are four plus threes, but again, we also do five plus fives, four plus fives, three plus fives, all comers. So what does the PSA do after we've done the laser treatment? Overall, we see around a 40% decline in PSA. Sexual health inventory for men or SHIM score is a standardized survey to measure erectile function. And we see no clinically significant decline in sexual function at 12 months in either population. International prostate symptom score is a survey that speaks to urologic function. And again, we see no statistically significant change at 12 months. <clears throat> PHQ-9 is a measure of emotional well-being. And again, no statistically significant change in emotional well-being at 12 months. But one thing to point out is the lower the PHQ-9 score, the better. When our salvage men present to us, they're freaking out. And then at three months, they're still kind of freaked out. At six months, they're getting really nervous. But then at one year, they calm down. And they're confident that with their PSA decline, with their negative biopsies, with their absence of imaging features suggesting recurrent disease, their hearts and their heads are in a happy place at 12 months. So our 10-year biopsy results pretty much have been stable for about four years. We have a clinically significant marginal recurrence rate of about 21%. If you look at the literature, you'll see that prostatectomy and radiation have about a 30% recurrence rate at five years. So here we sit with a lower recurrence rate and none of the morbidity associated with radiation or prostatectomy. Our Kaplan-Meier curves show less than 1% metastasis rate and no prostate cancer specific mortality. So that being said, we do have five men who have passed away, but it's of things other than their prostate cancer. So things like metastatic melanoma, esophageal cancer, Parkinson's disease, other primary cancers besides prostate cancer, those are the things that are taking the lives of our patients, not their prostate cancer. And like Dr. Herz, our urologist says, you know, you guys are going to do great because you're the ones that are educating yourselves and you're doing something. The guys that don't do well are the guys that do nothing. So keep on it, stay on top of it. 
So this is just a little summary of our 11 year results. And um, we discussed the biochemical recurrence rates. And the highlights here are really, you know, the better treatment planning, uh, increase in our margin size, uh, better risk stratification for all patients using PSA density, tissue-based genomics, uh, liquid biopsy, circulating tumor cells, circulating DNA, molecular imaging, Axomen, PSMA, and combination therapies where we use uh, laser focal therapy plus other stuff. And the best news about this is it's like a haircut. You can always go in and do it again. And the other options aren't off the table. Unlike radiation, unlike prostatectomy, once you have laser, you can have it over and over again. And once you've had laser, you can always have a prostatectomy or radiation. Everything remains on the table. It's safe, it's precise, it's outpatient feasible. We sculpt the therapy and create a transition zone uh, that compared to other energy sources is much more uh, uh, precise. We use biplane real-time MRI thermometry and safety boundaries around things that we don't wanna harm. And this is particularly amenable for apical cancers at the bottom of the prostate in that little tricky uh, kind of uh, peak at the bottom of the prostate. So where do we run into trouble when we get guys that I call a whack-a-mole? If their cancer comes back at the treatment site and they've got two or three more brand new cancers, this is a whack-a-mole and we pitch them over to whole gland therapy. So time permitting, it looks like we do have time. I'm gonna talk a little bit about genomic testing. I investigated all these different tests over the years and I found the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, some of them have great attributes, some not so much, um, but the two that I ended up um, really uh, believing in were Prostivision and Decipher. Prostivision is two genes and Decipher is 22. Um, ERG and P10 are the Prostivision genes and these are in the literature, they've been around a while. And the scores are uh, based on low, intermediate and high risk. So if the patient is not overexpressing ERG and they have both P10 alleles intact, they get a low risk score. So I liken this to a bicyclist. When you're a bicyclist on a backcountry road and there's nothing in your way and it's a relaxing ride, you're not overexpressing ERG. While you're on that backcountry road, if your front brakes and your back brakes are both working, you haven't lost P10. So every man is born with two P10 alleles. And if one or the other is missing, it's an it's a indicator of um, lessened immunosuppressive ability. So hemizygous deletion of P10 means one is missing. Homozygous deletion means both are missing. And then ERG overexpression, uh, it can either be positive or negative. So if you're overexpressing ERG, and you have homozygous deletion of P10, it's like you're on a wild mountain trail on the bike with no brakes. So that's one way to look at it. Um, when we see hemizygous deletion of P10, that's a score of four. When we see P10 intact, but overexpression of ERG, that's also a score of four, a low score. Intermediate score would be overexpression of ERG coupled with hemizygous deletion of P10. And a high score would be overexpression of ERG with homozygous deletion of P10. Both alleles are deleted and there's overexpression. So that's the wild mountain trail with no breaks. The other thing that we could see is insufficient. In other words, there's not enough tissue to run the test. So, about seven years ago, I approached the inventor of the Decipher test, which had been used postoperatively for all patients with adverse pathology after prostatectomy. What they would do is slice up the prostate, take RNA out of the tumor, 
and come up with a low intermediate or high risk score to decide should this patient get radiation on top of their prostatectomy. So I approached the inventor of the test and I asked him, when are you gonna do the cipher for biopsy? And he said, never. And I said, why not? And for all the reasons we talked about in the first 15 minutes of the lecture, he said, because biopsy is garbage, it's random, it doesn't make any sense, it's aimed at who knows what. And I said, well, what if I gave you gold? What if I gave you biopsy cores that were 1.8 centimeters in length, 20, 30, 40% tumor involved? Is that enough RNA for you to extract to run Decipher? And he said, let me think about it. So fast forward to February, 2016, they released Decipher for biopsy. So I went back in our cohort and I got a IRB approval to run not only the 22 gene panel clinically on these men to see the low intermediate or high risk status of these guys, but I was also able to run a 1.4 million genomic marker sequence under a research protocol to look at what's going on with our cancer patients. So this is what the report looks like. This is a low score, intermediate score, high risk score. And these are a couple of papers by Cooperberg and Ross talking about the value of decipher for prognostication and prediction of prostate cancer specific mortality. So let's do some case reviews here. We've got a 67 year old gentleman, Gleason four plus three. He had two negative transrectal ultrasound guided biopsies. We did his inbore biopsy to detect this four plus three that was missed uh, two years in a row. His PSA went to 8.3. We did his laser in September, 2015. After treatment, there's a number called the nadir. The nadir is the lowest level the PSA drops to after treatment. So he nadered at 0.58. His decipher score was 0.55, and he had a very low risk prostavision score. <coughs> Excuse me. And predictably, he had a negative six month biopsy. It's doing really well. Here's another case very low risk decipher score, low risk. Cross division score. He had had multiple negative truss biopsies. We biopsied an MR, got a three plus three. PSA was 2.1. We lasered him 2015. His PSA went up a little bit due to BPH, but uh, we kept him on active surveillance and he had a negative MR guided biopsy at six months. Now on the other side of the coin, here's a 76 year old with Gleason three plus four. PSA was 6.8 did his laser March, 2014, he nadered at 3.5, had a negative six month biopsy, but then his PSA started going up. It rose to 6.1. We found recurrent three plus four at two years post-treatment. And here you see a decipher score of 0.75. <coughs> He's in the high risk category. Another patient, three plus three, PSA was 5.4, lasered him January, 2011. He nadered at 4.1. His PSA went back up to over six in August, 2012. We lasered him again, August, 2012. He nadered at 3.4. Then his PSA started to rise again, January, 2016. Lasered him again, August, 2016. Again, look at this high risk decipher score. This gentleman, ended up being an interesting case for me because he was overexpressing something called glutathione peroxidase, which was a marker not only for prostate cancer, but also colorectal cancer. He ended up developing lymph node metastasis from a colorectal primary. So while we were all worried about his prostate cancer, he ended up developing a more uh, aggressive cancer that gave him lymph node metastasis. So these genomic markers can be very helpful <clears throat> and I'm seeing that we're almost at the hour. So if we're going to have a Q and a session, I think it would be safe to, um, uh, have some closing comments here, uh, pay close attention here. Uh, this literature is very important and it's the basis for why we do MR targeted biopsy. The target must be hit whether you're doing 
the biopsy for Gleason score or whether you're doing genomic tissue-based genomic testing, the target must be hit. So I'm gonna just fast forward through all this. And I have to acknowledge my team. Um, I was the founder and vice president of the International Laser Network, which has been absorbed by the Focal Therapy uh, Society, which is an arm of the Endourology Society. And uh, this is our facility here. This is the team that did the original research with me. And I gratefully acknowledge them for supporting my efforts. So what I'll do now is get out of here. And that's my email, Bernadette at halodx.com. Um, if you've got questions, we can address them now, or you could send me an email and I'll deal with it next week. And let me go back on video and open the floor to questions. Uh, go ahead and uh, can you hear me, Bernadette? I sure can. Okay, great. Yeah, uh, everyone, please do submit your questions using the, the Q&A uh, function on uh, Zoom. Um, and we'll uh, spend some time doing those. And, and uh, while those questions are coming in, uh, I also had had a, a couple of questions. Um, one perhaps is, uh, uh, so um, I had um, hormone therapy uh, in, um, uh, along with adjuvant uh, radiation. And I'm just curious whether, um, to, you know, from what, what I know, uh, the hormone therapy will shrink uh, tumors. Um, for me, this was all uh, after surgery, so uh, it was more of like the salvage type of situation with lymph nodes involved, but uh, with the prostate still there, do you ever encourage hormone therapy um, prior to uh, the, the laser focal treatment? That's a great question. So the way that the research protocol is written, it's laser only. It's not laser plus something else. So mm -hmm. we may get to a point in time where we are doing that, but currently we don't do it. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, and let's see, uh, why don't you take one of the questions out of the Q&A. It says, uh, do you think CMS slash Medicare will approve FLA for prostate cancer treatment within the next one to two years? That's another great question. In terms of CMS payment, what they need to see is evidence. Um, what we've done is we've published our results and we've done abstracts and scientific presentations every year for the last 11 years. And CMS wants to see 15 to 20 year results to prove non-inferiority to standard of care. So I envision in the next two to three years, we will have a type one CPT code for it. Um, right now there is no code, it's considered experimental and insurance is generally don't cover it. Great, great. Um, next question is, is, how common or uncommon is it for an MRI to change from PIRADS 2 slash 5 to PIRADS 5 slash 5 over a 12 month period? Um, if I understand the question correctly, the individual is asking, how common is it from a lesion to go from PIRADS 2 to PIRADS 5 in one year, very, very, very uncommon. I can count on one hand out of the thousands of patient encounters that I've had um, here in Indian Wells, the men who in 90 days went from, you know, Pyrex 2 to Pyrex 5, and we call that a peak and shriek. So um, it's very uncommon, but it falls right in line. When you look at the pie charts that I showed earlier of the men like the, you know, three to 7% of men that have lethal metastatic disease that's going to get them, you know, it's right in line with that. So MRI as a frontline diagnostic tool is definitely the way to go, but we have to also take into account genomic status. And that's how we're going to sift out the men that we really need to throw the kitchen sink at. Gotcha. Uh, by the way, I'm not sure you noticed, but you paused your video. Perhaps you can uh, turn that back on. Um, oh, sure. And, and stop the, the desktop sharing. Then people oh. don't have to look at me. <laughs> okay. There we go. Great. Um, how, does your, 
Uh, there was a couple questions that happened to go into the chat. Um, how do you how do you compare your technique with lasers to the use of proton treatment in salvage patients? So, if you were to go into Google and type in laser focal post proton therapy, you'll see a case study um, that appeared in the ASCO University. It was a patient that we treated who had had proton at Loma Linda and his cancer came back, his PSA went over six and we went in and we just treated it, no problem. Right. And people say you're not supposed to have a favorite child and in medicine, you're not supposed to have a favorite patient but this guy is actually my favorite patient. Uh, about a year and a half, two years ago, I was invited to do grand rounds at OHSU uh, for both pathology and radiology. And this patient joined me. So he was part of grand rounds and he kept it grand. When will imaging replace the invasive biopsy for diagnostic purposes? October, 2019. <laughs> yeah, um, it's and if you're is. if your urologist or your internal medicine physician or whoever is taking care of you doesn't know about this, Google just Google AUA policy statement October 2019. Print that thing up, walk in their office, place it on their desk, and say, "Why are you not imaging me before you put needles in me?" Yeah, I yeah. tell all my patients never let anyone put a needle or a scalpel anywhere near your prostate unless they've done MRI first. Yeah, it certainly and it's certainly all over the message. it's all over the literature. And not only is it all over the literature, it's not only in the radiology literature, it's in the urology literature too. So reference them back to their own journals. It's in their journals. Yeah. So and their guidelines. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it certainly is a, a powerful tool, uh, really important to have. Absolutely. And now we've got the uh, advent of uh, PSMA, prostate specific membrane antigen agents. I just submitted an investigational new drug application to the FDA so I can get gallium 68 at my facility. And I also want to get um, DCFPYL and I want to ultimately get lutetium 177. That's something we call a theranostic. It's the most amazing thing. It's a radionuclide that's got a hot ligand and a cold ligand. So when you inject it into the patient, it sticks to mammalian prostate cancer cells. So you're able to see where the prostate cancer is locally in the gland, if the gland is still there, where it is in the lymph nodes and the bones, but then it sticks to the cells and kills them. It's a twofer. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's called a theranostic. And uh, we've got colleagues in Australia and Germany doing it, but I have to tell you guys with the whole COVID thing, I worry about sending our patients across the pond. Um, I'd rather keep them here and keep them safe. Um, for those of you who've uh, dealt with the COVID, condolences, I know it's a, it's a drag. I had it and uh, still trying to come out the other side. So yeah, we've got we've to be careful. We've got to stay safe. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I guess I had heard about the um, uh, that that treatment a, a couple of years back after uh, you know I maybe even just before or after I started my radiation and I, I refer to it as the smart bomb uh, therapy. <laughs> exactly, so, I love it. Yeah, it certainly it's, it's gives me a, a lot miracle. of miracle if it comes back for me. Yeah. yeah, our patients have done really well. We've got some that went to Australia. We've got some that went to Germany. And I was just looking at a PET CT on one of them the other day, and I was just blown away, blown away. And, and he's living a normal life. I mean, this is a man who was terrified, you know, that this is the end, you mm -hmm. know. And, and the great thing about science and medicine is that there's always something new. There's always something on the horizon. And this is why we don't always do the kitchen sink approach at the beginning, because you look at the natural history of prostate cancer, we want to start at this end of the timeline, screening, detection, diagnosis, treatment, boom. That way our men, the metastatic potential of disease is interrupted 
So they never get to this end of the timeline where they've got metastatic castrate resistant disease. Pharma hates me because I don't need our patients to have all these expensive drugs and expensive treatments because we're getting in over here and we mm -hmm. never let it get here. Like only in like 3% of our patients has that even happened. Actually, I think it's less than 1% for bone mets, but still, I mean, um, you know, as, as we look at what's coming available, we have checkpoint inhibitors, we have immunotherapies, we've been playing with oncolytic virus, deploying um, something called ACAM 2000 into not only prostate tumors, but breast tumors and other tumors in stage four cancer patients with outstanding results. Um, so if you Google um, first in human oncolytic virus, uh, you'll see the paper and uh, it describes what we've been doing in that space. So there's always something, never lose hope. There's always something on the horizon. Interesting. Yeah, um, I think I've, let's see, this has moved here. Oh, is there any application for remote metastasis? And I guess you've already kind of kind of mentioned right, something yeah. but on the on laser um, flow side. We could theoretically uh, do laser on bone mets and it's been done. We mm -hmm. don't do it though, because it would probably require general anesthesia and everything that we do is in an outpatient setting with conscious sedation. So our patients receive a little, a little um, deployment of viscous lidocaine into the rectum to numb things up. Then we do um, a injection of Marcaine, which is like Novocaine when you get dental work done. Bilaterally on both sides of the gland, we inject the Marcaine and that serves two purposes. <coughs> the primary purpose is to numb the gland up, but it also does something called hydrodissection. It creates a space between the neurovascular bundles and the capsule. So we have a natural heat sink that's created there by the blood vessels that run on the side of the prostate. It, it, it creates a heat sink. So even if I wanted to kill the neurovascular bundles, it would take a lot of work. It would be hard to do, but we make that even more difficult by putting the Marcaine into that space and creating more room between the nerves and the capsule. Nice. And then we give for sudden fentanyl. So, I mean, happy drugs make everything better. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. Um, let's see. I think, uh, I think we've got all the questions that were online answered, but let me just go through my Great. notes and see if I had a couple other ones. Um, sure. I guess you, you did have a, a, a slide on um, what, when you were showing like what percent of the patients are three plus three, three plus four or five plus five, everything for, you know, uh, salvage and, and so forth. But like um, perhaps uh, I, I don't think I quite um, saw in, in that slide what percent of the prostate could uh, what, what, what's like the maximum amount of the prostate that could be involved and still do LFA? Oh, um, that's a great question. So our research protocol says the patient can have not one, not two, but three lesions. We could go after a maximum of three. In the salvage setting, we'll do as many as we need to, to debulk and to kill the mother ship. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And honestly, when we conduct tumor board and we do a multidisciplinary tumor board twice a month, we look at each case, we look at how many lesions are there, how big are they, where are they located, and then we decide what instruments do we need to achieve optimal oncologic control while preserving sexual and urologic function. So the short answer is it kind of doesn't matter. Uh, the long answer is what I just gave you, but this is what determines the instruments that we use and how we approach it. Gotcha. We can get very aggressive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I started to think back like, oh yeah, well, you have the imaging, so you have a, a much better uh, uh, picture of what's going on. Whereas I, of course, had the random 12 core. And so really still to this day, I don't know how much of my prostate was involved, although I think I right. had like five of the cores come back positive, um, right. including both sides. Um, uh, and let's see, you did talk about the PSA decline. Um, yeah, I think that was it for all the, uh, the questions that I had. So Excellent. I, 
Yeah, I certainly learned a lot. And um, I want to thank you for all of the great work you've done. You've, you're obviously you're so welcome. It's yeah. a labor of love. <laughs> Everyone yeah. always asks me, you know, did your father have prostate cancer? Why are you doing this? And as I said at the beginning, my early research was in breast cancer. So my nickname was the breast lady for about 10 years. And then um, out of training, my very first job was in urology. And it's funny how things came full circle because um, my GM at Phillips asked me, can you take everything you know about anatomic morphologic imaging, quantification and reporting interventional planning for breast cancer and move it from up here to down there? And I'm like, sure, let's do it. And that's when I got involved in the prostate space. And I know I have friends and family that have been affected by prostate cancer. And it's a thing that is uh, uh, near and dear to my heart. And I think that, um, you know, as long as we're all doing the right things the right way at the right time, it is a very, very curable, very survivable disease. Um, and I think that um, the things that I've been able to do at Desert Medical Imaging, now Halo Diagnostics, under the leadership of Dr. John Feller, you know, a lot of these things that we've developed are, are going to help a lot of men down the road. So I'm grateful for the leadership and, and, and mentorship that I've had through uh, my universities and my medical director. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. And, and do keep us uh, up to date on, on um, uh, the new uh, treatments as well. New radio, as, new clients. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I'll yeah. let your gang know. I know that um, I think for the longest time, people only knew about um, going up to San Francisco to have it done. And I guess UCLA now has the uh, gallium uh, as well, but yep. uh, yeah, certainly having more options to go. I myself, I'd much rather head up to the Palm Springs area than the LA area. So it's nice, especially in December. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Well, All right. Again, um, I thank you. I thank you for having me. And uh, gentlemen, ladies, you've got my email address. If you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to help. Excellent. And I see a number of thank yous have come in on the, the Q&A and the chat. So yeah, Most thank you welcome. very much. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again, uh, hopefully in person next time. I hope so. All right. Stay safe, everybody. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.